well, thanks everybody for uh, for joining and uh, for stopping in today. Um, I'm going to just say a few quick things. First of all, uh, just about the concept of openness and the importance that it has. When I first got here to, to UTA, one of the first things we did was uh, brought in David Wiley to spend some time with us uh, talking about openness and open education. Uh, unfortunately, uh, not much has transpired. We had lofty notions of first year, uh, you know, all open content for students on campus. There's a lot of interest in finding ways to use open educational materials to reduce the expenses that students face. The Gates Foundation has invested heavily in uh, requiring all of their grantees submit their content openly and make it openly available and so on. So the open education movement is one that has a cost imperative, at least in the U.S. context. And that cost imperative is reducing the cost for students who are most challenged in their ability to access higher education. Uh, the OER movement, as Roy and I were talking about this morning, has gone from um, sort of that, uh, you know, Victoria's Secret lingerie wearing stage to post-baby comfortable pajamas stage now, which means that all the important stuff is happening at this stage with, with regard to OER work. It's moving uh, behind the scenes. It's beginning to be incorporated in university practices. It's beginning to have a financial impact. Simple statement that Rory made the, uh, just on the way down was that just the work that he did at AU with uh, OERs has saved over uh, $2 million uh, to the university over the last several years. So it is a cost aspect. Another equally important aspect is the innovation component. Uh, if you want innovation, you need some level of openness because people have to be able to build on the work of others. If you can't build on the work of others, you're not going to have innovation. And so I think that's another aspect of why OERs are so critical. But I'll let Rory go through that. He has uh, a far better uh, pedigree and awareness of the educational landscape globally. I know he spends an enormous amount of his time traveling. And so a few, well, maybe a month ago or so when Rory reached out just to mention he was in town visiting family, uh, to have him come down was a real uh, treat on our end. I first met Rory at uh, an open education conference in Vancouver. I was at, uh, at that point in sunny, balmy, tropical Winnipeg, and uh, he uh, offered a position that was open at Athabasca University, and then uh, shortly after that, ended up making the transition to Athabasca, and at that point, it was with TechRe. Roy was, was the VPR research on campus, and I think modeled the research discipline um, very well. He is also a curmudgeonly bastard, but that's not to be seen in a negative way. Um, I think it was Alec Koros emailed me one time and he said, uh, what's up with Rory? He seems to look curmudgeonly because I think he had met Rory at a conference. Uh, just like I told some of you a few years ago, I was in a meeting and I'm known for sort of advocating for social pedagogical viewpoints. And we had a, an external partner that was in town who's going to do some Moodle development work for us in creating an e-portfolio. And I'd had a discussion with Rory before this. So this, there's two quick stories here. This is the first one about you know, social pedagogies, and for whatever reason, Rory decided to chew these things over in his head. So we're sitting in a meeting. We've got uh, our on-campus uh, technical team here. We have these off-campus partners that have been helped with this. I'm there with Terry Anderson. Rory's sitting across, and the meeting gets going, and all of a sudden, Rory, for whatever reason, felt this was the right opportunity to say, social pedagogy is crap. Show me one article that emphasizes it. And I'm sitting there and our partners are all like, what's going on? But I mean, I knew this was a spillover from our conversation 45 minutes ago that Rory felt we should address right now. And so we did. And another uh, aspect that I find you quite- provide the article? <laughs> no, not necessarily because, but all the technical guys, they were sort of like, what's, what's happening here? As Rory went on his tirade against uh, constructivist pedagogies. Uh, another incident, uh, which is probably my uh, the most consistent memory I have. So if you ever get an opportunity uh, and Rory and Terry Anderson are around, hang out for drinks with them. Because it starts like this. They have a few drinks. Rory gets a little bit cantankerous and pokey. And then Terry bites the bait every single time. So Rory will start, then he'll start saying some things progressively more intense. And then all of a sudden, Terry will start to bite in every single time I've seen it happen. And then you have this big old argument where Terry's getting progressively more agitated, and Rory seems to be having the time of his life. So <laughs> something to think about. All you need is scotch and whiskey for that particular experience. <laughs> anyway, far off topic. Uh, it's a real privilege to have Rory here, and he's going to talk to us about OERs and some ways in which that will impact the future of education. So if you want this, sort of aim it there, I think, and it should work. Okay. Okay. 
It's always good when the technology works. Try aiming it there. Should have listened to you, George. <laughs> um, <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. Um, you will probably find that my talk is a little bit biased in favor of open educational resources. And uh, um, that's because I'm the UNESCO Commonwealth of Learning International Council for Open and Distance Education Chair in Open Educational Resources. So I have a responsibility to promote and support open educational resources institutionally, nationally, and internationally, uh, particularly in developing countries. And I'm also the co-chair of the Alberta Provincial Initiative on Open Educational Resources. So it's, this is a one-talk shop. This is a one-subject uh, display that we're having today. <laughs> Just to let you know, you can use these slides. They're on, on uh, George's machine now. They're also in Dropbox. Uh, uh, they're openly licensed. Uh, I must say, though, that some images are fair dealing or fair use in the United States. You can use them for research and educational purposes. Um, my responsibility comes from the 2012 <laughs> Paris Open Education Resource Declaration, um, which basically says that open education resources are important for uh, reaching the Millennium Development Goals of Education for All in the World. Um, and it's not a belief that OER are the solution, uh, but that uh, whatever solution comes up or solutions for universal education, OER will be part of the mixture, that they are important for that uh, purpose. Um, if you trying to get used to this thing here. There it is, okay. <clears throat> if you uh, want to find more, if, if you're uh, about open education resources, I suggest you go to the Commonwealth of Learning site. There are many uh, books, pamphlets, and other information about OER and what they are. For me, uh, personally, um, is uh, that I believe that as an educator, um, the main challenge for educators in the 21st centuries is this, that by 2025, there'll be about 100 million students capable of post-secondary education that will not be able to access it, either because it isn't there or because they can't afford it. And, uh, um, uh, <clears throat> It's been predicted uh, um, that we would have to build four universities per week of 30,000 students each to be able to meet this demand uh, using traditional means. So we need to find new scalable ways of bringing education to these masses of students. This is the question, how can we educate all these learners? And uh, um, OER will be part of the solution. Now, the internet is the biggest commons. It's an intellectual commons that belongs to all of us. It has the shared uh, heritage of mankind. The public domain is a priceless shared heritage. All knowledge is based on previous knowledge. There are no new ideas, completely new ideas. They're all based on what happened before. Or as Newton said, uh, that he was standing on the shoulders of giants. And uh, um, we need to be able to share this knowledge. And in fact, uh, uh, sharing is what educators do, is uh, we share our knowledge. <clears throat> now, copyright, what does it mean? Very clearly, the copyright was in instituted to encourage learning and promote the progress of science and the useful arts, not to protect the rights of the author. 
And you ask people today, what is copyright? They say, oh, that's to protect the rights of the author. No, it was never instituted for that purpose. In fact, it was brought in to limit the rights of authors and uh, printers and publishers. Uh, Jazzy calls this view of copyright protecting the rights of the author as para-copyright or pseudo-copyright. <clears throat> Copying has been around for many years. Um, the concept of copyright was utterly foreign to the ancient mind. In fact, copyists were the most respected people in society. Uh, these scribes, these were uh, very highly respected. They were venerated in many cases. So the idea that uh, you, uh, uh, you keep it to yourself and you don't let others copy it was just totally foreign and just did not exist in the past. The first copyright law actually came out in Ireland with Colum Killer in Scotland. They know him as St. Columba. Uh, he copied St. Finian's psalm book. And King Dermot ruled to every cow its calf, to every book its copy, a very strict version of copyright. Um, but uh, they got in an argument over it, and Colum Kill defeated uh, uh, the king and his troops at Culladrain in Sligo in 561, and about 3,000 people were killed. So it was an important issue even back then. And, uh, uh, but having, uh, having defeated the king, the bishop ordered him out of Ireland, and St. Columba went to Iona and set up a monastery there that uh, brought enlightenment to Europe. The monks from, from Iona went all over Europe uh, educating people. But the real modern <laughs> copyright law is this one, the Statute of Queen Anne, 1710. Look at the title. The title of an act usually gives you a good idea of what it was about. An act for the encouragement of learning, not an act to protect authors' rights. It was brought in to encourage learning, and the idea was if we give a monopoly to the author for a short period of time, this will help encourage the spread of knowledge and the creation, creativity, etc. And uh, the United States Constitution uh, is based on Queen Anne's law. There were four states in the United States uh, that had copyright laws at the time of the revolution, and those uh, very similar, and they were combined together and put into the American Constitution. So it's, uh, it, it is definitely developed from Queen Anne's law. And uh, look at the title, an act to promote the progress of science and the useful arts. Again, in the United States, it was not brought in to protect the rights of the author. Jefferson put it this way, its peculiar character is that no one possesses the less because every other possesses the whole of it. He who receives an idea from me receives instruction himself without lessening mine, as he who lights his taper at mine receives light without darkening me. And of course the idea is, is you're spreading knowledge and some people say, and I heard still today, oh, I'm not going to give away my content. You're not giving anything away. You're keeping it. You're giving it, but you keep it. And this is a big difference between uh, property and content, is you can keep it. You can spread enlightenment and keep it yourself. So don't use the term giving it away. And he says, I set out on this ground, which I suppose to be self-evident that the earth belongs in use to the living, but the dead have neither power nor rights over it. And of course, today uh, in the United States and many countries, copyright goes to 70 years after the death of the author. In Canada, it's 50 years, uh, but uh, they're trying to change that and make it uh, 
uh, 70 years. Um, I tell the story about my my sister. She uh, she wants to be buried in a cardboard box, and uh, you wonder why she wants that. She thinks it's because, or she says it's because she wants to be modest and you know she doesn't believe in big funerals and everything. But my view is that she wants to uh, embarrass her husband and her brother to say, look how cheap he is. <laughs> and it's called uh, Control Beyond the Grave. And uh, this is what Jefferson is talking about, that really you have no right to control people after you're dead. But uh, this is, is not a good thing. And he says, inventions cannot be a subject of property. This is very important. They use the term now intellectual property, which is a lie. It's, it, it, it's disingenuous. Um, very clearly, American copyright, um, inventions cannot be a subject of property. And James Madison, uh, um, he confirms this incentive, not property or natural law, is the foundational justification for American copyright. It is a privileged monopoly. So what you have when you create uh, a work is you have a copyright, which is a monopoly bestowed on you by the government in order to promote learning and the useful arts. It is not property. Um, but the big publishers keep pushing the notion of property because we all love property and uh, we don't like monopolies too much. John Perry Barlow put it this way, the greatest constraint on your future liberties may come not from government but from corporate legal departments that are laboring to protect by force what can no longer be protected by practical efficiency or general social consent. So the big publishers are the ones really pushing these uh, strict versions of uh, copyright and trying to turn it into a, a property right. So what does copyright mean? Well, number one, no one owns ideas. Ideas belong to everybody. Copy holder, copyright holders possess a copyright it protects the expression of ideas, not the ideas. And holders have a limited right to control the expression of their ideas for a limited time. This limited time has been stretched from 17 years originally to now 70 years beyond the death of the author. And it seems that every time that Mickey Mouse comes up uh, to copyright that they stretch it even further. And uh, it was... Uh, Sonny Bono's wife uh, uh, was in uh, the Congress and uh, uh, she was supporting the, these extensions and uh, uh, they asked her, um, what is your view of a limited time? And she said that forever less a day, that's a li limited time. So it could be going on uh, forever if, if we let them. <clears throat> Oops. Oh, can't go backwards. Yes, I can. Keep trying. There. So, what it doesn't mean is the right of the author, the right of the author, which is in Europe uh, the fact. In, in Europe, uh, copyright was brought in uh, in order to, uh, uh, to protect the rights of the author. So, they don't use the term copyright. They use droit d'auteur and the rights of the author. But we have a different tradition in the British common law tradition, and uh, we don't accept that. In 1963, however, we agreed with the American definition, with the World Intellectual Property Office, that everything is copyrighted. So you write an email, and somebody 
takes your email and forwards it to somebody else without your permission, they are breaking copyright. How many have done that? I think we all do it every day. We're all guilty. It's a, it's a dangerous situation to be in. In Nazi Germany, they said, we know everyone's breaking the law somehow. What we do is we bring them in and we find out what it is. So, yes, we're all Sorry, breaking Link the law. Motto. Yes. That's how George works, right? <laughs> we're all breaking the law since 1963. Before 1963, you had to put the little C with a circle on it for it to be copyrighted. But now everything is copyrighted. So, OER, what are they? I'm not going to go with this group into the definition. I think you all know it. Uh, but open ed resources for consultation. And uh, they did originally say for non-commercial purposes, but not anymore. You say even if you want to make money on it, good for you. You make money on it. Um, could be different things. We generally think of them as textbooks, uh, uh, especially here in Canada and the United States. Uh, uh, but it could be a game. It could be a video. It could be a, an audio tape. It could be curriculum material. So there's a wide range of what open educational resources can be. And it comes from the learning object movement. And uh, that's how I got into open education resources was uh, um, I was among the early people experimenting with learning objects in the uh, <coughs> early 1990s. And uh, uh, the idea was that uh, you have a component which could be a picture or a piece of text or whatever. And uh, you put a number of them together, you get a lesson. Um, you put a number of lessons together and you get a module. You put a number of modules together and you get a course. And you can even put a number of uh, courses together and you, get a, you can have a full program. So that's the idea of uh, uh, learning objects and granularity. And we were working on these in the 1990s. And what we found out was uh, when you get to intellectual property and uh, um, uh, who owns what, you get yourself into a conundrum. Is uh, We tried to make an, uh, an agreement uh, between two universities. And there's about seven or eight problems you come up with. You bring in a third university. It's not just seven or eight problems. It's seven or eight problems times three. And times four, you bring in another one, it becomes exponential until finally you realize with six or seven universities, which we had an agreement with across the country, all the money you have will go to the lawyers for your research. So we realized we could not work with commercial content, that we had to come up with open license. And this is before uh, creative commons and open licensing came in. So we had to have an agreement that we would all be able to share it. And uh, uh, even that was, uh, was extremely difficult before creative commons. So OER, uh, we can mix them, we can adapt them, extract them, localize, translate, reuse, repurpose. Basically, you can do whatever you want with it, as opposed to commercial content. Whoa, that went quick. Um, I want to also say that it is OER are related to the open access movement, but the open access movement is, is focused on scholarly articles. And um, open education resources are the educational use. And the big difference is scholarly articles. People aren't really interested in mixing, mashing, localizing them, etc. cetera. Um, and quite often, they put on uh, the uh, uh, um, no derivatives license. And that's fine, because people don't really want to change them. But OER are changeable, that we can do what we want with them in our, our uh, educational uh, environment.
Now, are they free? This is important because invariably somebody said, well, nothing's free. Well, duh, yeah, you're right. But they have to point this out, you know. It's not free. There's no such thing as a free lunch. And somebody else wants to bring this up. Yeah, somebody is paying for this. But they are free to the users, to the students, to the institutions that use them. But yes, somebody is paying for them, either um, the university by paying the salary of the uh, faculty member, or um, um, we actually have programs where we pay the professor to, uh, uh, to develop the material or to adapt material uh, in order to use it as an OER. So yes, they're free to the users. Um, there's no unnecessary duplication. So one of the good things about it is, if there's a module out there, OER, um, that you want to use, you can just take it and use it. You don't have to redo it and make it yourself. This sharing, it reduces the costs of development. So if you don't have to develop it yourself, you have it and it removes the, that cost. It removes the costs of copyright clearance, which is a real pain. Many universities have one or two people hired who only do copyright clearance. That's their job. And of course, it engages an open community. And I can give you one example at our university. We had a, uh, uh, a faculty member who uh, uh, wanted to develop a course in green computing. And uh, he talked to me and I said, why don't you check it out to see if uh, there's any OER? And he said, well, how do I do that? And I said, Google green computing course. And he was a bit embarrassed that he was a computing science professor. <laughs> he knew that. So he Googled green computing course, and not at the top, but halfway down the first page, green computing course, Australian National University. He said, oh, that's interesting. He took a look at it, and he came back me a week later and he said it has everything I need. It was even in Moodle, the learning management system that we were doing, we were using at our university. He said it saved him a year's work. <clears throat> everything was there and what he did was he added Canadian examples to them because they were all Australian examples. And uh, now the professor in Australia uses some of those Canadian examples. And so it was a huge uh, a, a huge cost, time saving, etc. And that's just one example of it. So, the cost considerations of using commercial content, um, developing and improving ongoing program. You still, you still have costs with commercial content. Yes. You know, um, when you want to enhance the teacher presence of your course, do you think students? And I've heard this. Well, they must feel they're cheated by in nine tenths of their courses because in most universities in Canada, I meant with online. Pardon? I meant with online courses. They want to see the professor. They want it to be somehow you can be branded like I'm paying to go to the GA by and not getting on this. You get that, but don't you? You'll find out that even online, nine tenths of the courses they don't use their own material. In fact, why would they? They're not course designers. They use a, a, a commercial textbook or commercial content. And uh, that is the, the fact. Now, uh, for those who develop their own, some students like it, some don't. I've heard the opposite complaint. He's using his own textbook and charging us for it. Um, so yeah, I mean, there are some, but uh, it, 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 this isn't a problem with OER. This is a problem Generally, it's not an open education resource problem. It's it's the same problem if they're using a commercial textbook or uh, or OER, because most use textbooks, some kind of commercial textbook. 
very few actually have courses where it's all developed by themselves. No? I'm not... We have to design our own courses with guidance from a course developer. And it's, I know that having a teacher presence is too precise. And I'm not against OER. I'm a yeah. heavy user, and I also create a lot of my own content. And I don't see faculty creating their own content. No. And so I think there's that tension of all this great stuff off the internet, quality, you know, be damned or whatever, but versus, and then pure laziness versus like making an effort to like get your face in the course at a minimum to, you know, I, I don't see faculty being themselves. I think but there's a risk. In, in my experience, the, there are two. Um, two uh, tendencies in the open education resource movement. There's one, like you described, where they want OER because you can create your own courses, and develop your own material. And this is a way of changing education, and that's why they support OER. And then there's the others who just want free content, the full package. And I, I believe they're the majority. Um, I'd say, I think David Wiley estimated it to be about 85 to 90 percent of teachers. They want the full package. They don't want to develop their own material. And why would they? They're, like, they're chemistry professors. They're not learning designers. They're not, they're not interested in creating new content like that. Some of them are, because the minority are. And so, I mean, that's the issue. But it's not an OER issue, because people are using other content, and you should, because most people cannot create good content. Most people, they create their own content, not very good. I mean, there's a certain talent in there that is different from the talent that you have as a physics teacher or uh, history teacher, or whatever. It's a, it's a different uh, set of skills that you need. But uh, uh, it's a very good point, a very good point. Cost considerations of using commercial content is this. OER are free and adaptable, uh, but uh, the ongoing program and course design, uh, planning of contact sessions with students, development of learning materials, the design of effect, all of these things you do whether or not you have OER. With commercial content, you still have to do these things. So there is still cost considerations uh, but OER are free and adaptable, and uh, you're you're much uh, uh, you can do a lot more when you have the open education resources. Um, if you look at these rent books that we have now, um, uh, David Wiley tells us that students own nothing; they can share nothing, they save nothing, they can sell nothing, like you can with a print book, for example. When the subscription ends, everything ends. The publishers own the student data, own the students' notes, own their highlights, and the students cannot transfer the data um, to their own uh, machine. So uh, uh, there's big problems with the uh, commercial learning services. And uh, David uh, points out this, this fact. Is Netflix $8 a month? I think it's $9 a month now. 20,000 movies, Hulu Plus, 45,000 TV shows, eight, nine dollars a month. Spotify, 15 million songs, $10 a month. One biology text from Course Smart, $20.25 a month. There's a huge discrepancy. And the reason is quite simple is that educational publishing is the most profitable part of the entire publishing industry. You think it's Harry Potter or Fifty Shades of Grey? <laughs> no, they, they do make good money from that and it's a one-off after 10 or other, but the gravy train for the publishing industry is educational publishing. They make a fortune and it's a guaranteed every year a continual cycle that they make uh, their money from. And uh, so they want to keep it. They want to keep the gravy train uh, rolling and uh, they charge for it. Now, how open is an open license? There's a number of different ones. We'll be focusing uh, on uh, the Creative Commons license. That's the one most commonly used. Um, 
the thing to know is that it is not public domain. Public domain is pretty well everything produced before 1923 in the United States. Um, maybe 1927 now, public domain, because it's old and it's, it, the copyright's expired 70 years after the life of the author. In fact, uh, Hemingway is now public domain in Canada, but not in the United States, because we have a 50-year ex expiry date. Um, Creative Commons was brought in because now that everything is copyrighted since 1963, unless you put in a, a, a permission, um, people can't use it. They have to ask you for permission. And so it's, it's problematic. So if you put in the Creative Commons license, it avoids automatic copyright restrictions. Um, the idea that it's copyrighted and people have to ask your permission all the time. Uh, we have it for different countries and languages, and in fact, the international license now works in all countries. And there's a license generator available online uh, that uh, uh, publishes uh, the license in human-readable language, legal language, and machine-readable language. And it allows others to copy or change without permission. Uh, but it reserves some rights, for example, the author's rights, and some freedoms are restricted, uh, like attribution, reuse, uh, commercial, or, or making changes. And here's uh, a screenshot of the uh, license application. So you can go there, and you answer a number of questions, and it'll generate a license for you. And we recommend the two licenses on the left as being open. The ones on the right are restricted, and we do not recommend them, but they have their uses. And that is attribution by, well, if we're in an academic uh, situation, we have to put the name of the original authors anyway. Otherwise, it's plagiarism. So that's not a, a restriction, really. We just have to use the original author's name. And share alike is this, that if somebody takes your um, uh, content and adds to it or changes it in some way, they must use the same license. They cannot change the license. So somebody might take your content, add piles to it, and then add a non-commercial on it. But if you put the share alike on, they can't do that. They're, they're not allowed. They must keep the same license. The no derivatives is used uh, uh, mainly in uh, for scholarly articles where you don't want people to change it. Um, uh, and it's used by some open publishing companies uh, because uh, if it's translated to another language, they want to get some money out of it to support the publishing enterprise. So um, it's restrictive. And we don't recommend it because of that, that uh, you can't change it in any way. And OER, the general idea is you can change it however you want. And then the non-commercial is for people who think they're going to make a lot of money out of their uh, content. And, uh, uh, or they think that if somebody else makes money, I want uh, a cut of it, which is uh, uh, very hopeful on the part of educators. Not too many make money. I have a best-selling book in uh, learning objects, and uh, it sold 376 copies. And this is a bestseller. They sell it to university libraries, because uh, even I'm the author, and I can't understand why anyone would buy it. It was $250 for the book. Um, and uh, this was considered a bestseller, but I didn't make any money out of it. They charged $250. I, I, I don't think I made a thousand dollars out of it. So educational publishing, you don't really make a lot of money, except for a very few people. Yes? You do. One possibility for monetization is a lot of young people who have made a fortune off YouTube. So I think that there's other avenues besides proof text that actually are good for monetization. I've actually thought about doing it, having a YouTube channel, and it's possible with enough use, and it's free for the user to make a lot of money. 
Oh no, I, I support that 100%. If, I could, if yeah. I could make a great video, uh, commercial video like that, or I could write something like the 50 series of McGrail, <laughs> <laughs> make a huge amount of money, I put copyright like I'm not against copyright. But this is not copyright. Hmm? It's not copyright. Oh, it is. How do many make their ad? That's the majority of people making the app to make it through sponsorships. It's open and it's about. Yeah, but openness isn't the same. The reuse has to be there. There's no reuse. Yeah, there's no reuse. I'll make it to you. Yeah, everything is cost unless un unless you put the, uh, an open license on it. So it is copyrighted. I think it's wonderful. I think it's great. Make as much money as you can off it. We're not against that. What I guess what I, what I would stress is this: is you're an educator. They're not going to make much money out of this. Like they're not making the money. So like, why is this a big deal for you? And if you are, I don't even blame them. You know, if, if your accounting textbook is being sold nationwide and you're making a couple of hundred thousand dollars every semester, I shut up about it and collect the money. Like I don't, I'm not against that. I can understand that uh, why they're doing it, but I also understand that. We can come up with an open education resource accounting one to compete with you. And it's pretty hard to compete with uh, free, but some do and they can get away. So I'm not against it. I, I support copyright. Um, what I don't like is 70 years after the death. Like I think it should be originally 17 years and, and then it goes into the public domain. But, uh, um, that's arguable. But the idea of copyright is uh, is a good one. I think. It was brought in to support learning to use full arts. And it was considered that giving the author these, this monopoly, a privileged monopoly, would help. And I think it does to a certain extent. So it, it's a good idea. And so, yes, uh, um, if, if you're running a YouTube uh, uh, do and you're getting all kinds of followers, don't go. Don't go this. But Lawrence Lessing put it this way. He said, you know, we need one law for Britney Spears to protect her songs. But in education, it just doesn't work. It just doesn't work in education. It, uh, uh, it, it's a huge expense on education. And uh, most people aren't making money on it, uh, only the publishers. The Canadian Supreme Court uh, came up with a view. This is the only uh, Supreme Court in the world that's made uh, an assessment of fair dealing or fair use. And the thing I want to point out is they ruled that fair dealing must have a large and liberal interpretation. And it's like fair dealing and fair use in the United States is people are not giving it a large and liberal interpretation. Uh, but uh, the only court case around says that it, you must give it a large and liberal interpretation. Um, techno it's technologically neutral. Um, and there's no such thing as a 10% limit or 5% limit, either fair dealing or fair use. And you can make class copies. And you can make course packs. And... Uh, the act of reading is an exercise that will almost always constitute fair dealing, even when it is carried out solely for personal enlightenment or entertainment. And the purpose of all that, I'm showing that, is that we need, as educators, to take a large and liberal view of fair use and to take full advantage of it. There's a huge gray area there, and we can use commercial content up to a certain amount, a reasonable amount, and quite often we're not doing it because we're scared of being sued or we're worried about things that aren't worth worrying about. Now, intellectual property, as I mentioned before, um, and you see by the sign here, "Woody Woody Sweet Patootie is neither intellectual nor property. <laughs> and uh, 
They still insist on calling it intellectual property when the correct term is privileged monopoly. But they don't like using, publishers don't like using the term monopoly because we don't like monopolies. I think Teddy Roosevelt broke them all up in the early uh, 20th century and uh, we haven't liked them since. We're against monopolies, but we're support property. And this is why William Blackstone said that there's nothing which so generally strikes the imagination and engages the affections of mankind as the right of property. We love property. Or that soul and despotic dominion which one man claims and exercises over the external things of the world in total exclusion of the right of any other individual in the universe. And uh, this is why we prefer to use the term uh, property, even though they're wrong in using that term. But uh, is it property? Or is this monopoly uh, a manifestation of government intervention in social relations? What it is, is the government interfering in the marketplace and giving a monopoly uh, to one group. It's similar to imposing duties, uh, restricting your freedom, and inflicting a burden on users. So they pretend that it's property uh, because of our good feelings about it, and uh, they try to downplay the fact that they have a monopoly and that the government has given them that monopoly, um, uh, similar to giving people, uh, restricting people's freedom and uh, imposing duties. And then they put into it a digital rights management or digital locks. We call them technological protection measures. And what they do is uh, they put these locks into your device in order to stop you from using your device the way you want to use it. Um, a few years ago, if you, uh, if you remember, um, uh, Amazon went into people's computers who bought Animal Farm and without their permission, just went in and took it away from them after they bought it because there was some copyright dispute or something. And they just took it away. And uh, they, uh, um, it, it was a shock to people that they could do it. But in fact, they could. And with their, with their digital locks, they had an end to your computer that they could take it out. There's three common types of digital rights management. Amazon has its own. Apple uses Fair Play and Adobe uh, called Adobe Adept. Uh, these are all being used uh, by these uh, three major corporations. But who's losing? Any obstacle that makes a record harder to listen to is bad news for the artist that made it. And they bring in all kinds of uh, uh, digital locks and it makes the pirate version better than the official version. And I mentioned the Sony rootkit because uh, uh, about five years ago, they put in digital rights management uh, software that destroyed your operating system if you download it. And uh, it was a huge scandal a few years ago. Now, with digital rights management, what it does is it takes your device and uh, makes it so that uh, in using your device, which by the way is property, this is my property, I own this. They say you can't copy, paste, annotate, text-to-speech, very bad for this, uh, visually disabled students. Uh, you can't format change, you can't even move it from one computer to another. You can't print out the material. You can't move it geographically. I, I had an e-textbook. I tried to read it on the airplane, and it said they have no access to the internet. We cannot verify that you have a license to access this. Got to France, got to my hotel room, went to read it. It said, you're not allowed to read it in, in this country. You cannot use it in this country. They control my device. I don't control it. They control it. Um, you can't use it after an expiry date. 
And can you imagine somebody who's using uh, commercial content, uh, Calculus 1, and after the exam it disappears, so he's taking Calculus 2 and he has no access to his Calculus 1 textbook. Um, and unlike print books, you can't resell uh, the e-books, and it's all prevented by uh, digital locks. Digital rights management software, it needs deep permissions into the operating system. It can stop normal operating system function. That is, we have no control of what they're doing with our computer. They control what they can do with our computer. How many have I used now these access codes? You have them in many courses now. And again, uh, uh, they can take away your access code. Um, they charge as much for the access code as they do for the textbook. So if a student uh, buys a, text, a print textbook on a resale market, he still has to pay $195 to access the, uh, the uh, uh, online environment. I bring this up because I started uh, my computer career a long time ago with the Commodore 64. Does anyone here remember this? I had a VIC-20. You had a VIC-20, that yeah, was even before the Commodore 64. Yeah, I had 64 after the VIC-20. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I learned long ago, um, uh, this issue came up. Uh, they had a, uh, a word processing software called Paperclip. But in order to use the Paperclip, they give you a dongle they called it a dongle, and you had to stick the dongle into the back of your computer. Otherwise, the software wouldn't work. And invariably, I'd, bring my, I'd go here, and it wouldn't work here, and then I couldn't find the dongle, and then the kids would be playing, and they'd have the dongle, and then it's a crib, and I, all the time I was looking for the dongle, driving my wife crazy. Where's this dongle? Why don't you keep it in your pocket? <laughs> it drove me crazy, and uh, um, I joined a group of hackers uh, and uh, uh, who hacked successfully hacked the program, and we finally got it that we could use it with Oxidongo, and uh, and that's what we did. That the pirated version was better than the uh, commercial product, and. Uh, I mean, if that's the case, I mean, there's no real business case going forward if the pirated version is better than the original. And I want to emphasize this. The copyright they have is not, is not property. It is a monopoly. This is property. This belongs to me. I own this. And by putting in their digital rights management, it restricts my freedom. And there's a simple question. Can we not own and control our own property? They're putting locks on us, onto our property, but we're innocent. Even before, they have no evidence that we're breaking the law or doing anything uh, wrong. But, uh, but they put the locks on us anyway. Oh my God, what happened there? This is very temperamental. You're talking about locks? Yes. How do I get back? It's not working. Okay, back again. So, can you get this in the United States? We get it all the time in Canada. Very rarely. Yeah, actually, if you go, if you want to find Canadian hockey teams, for example, yeah. oh, you yes. get it every damn day. Is that right? <laughs> Hypothetically. <laughs> who, who would want to do that? <laughs> Unless you have access to VPN. I can extend the songs. I, I like to, I listen to a lot of songs through YouTube. I don't know why. It's not even like I watch the video. It's just easier for me to search what I want. Because not everything is on, like Pandora, Spotify, or something. 
that I can usually find any song I want on YouTube, but some of them I can't. Some aren't restricted, some aren't. Yeah, yeah. Well, I have a quick comment. You can do a YouTube a Creative Commons license on YouTube videos. People can remix and reuse. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, there's an option direct, yeah, directly in you. Pardon? But how is it not OER? If you put the CC on it, it is OER. Otherwise, no, everything on YouTube is copyrighted unless you put the CC on. The same with Google uh, or, or anything you put on, on the web. You can go to Google and you can restrict your search so as it only finds openly licensed material. But you have to do that in order for it to be uh, open. And so you get this, uh, it's uh, video available, is not available in your country. It's quite common around the world. And uh, it basically restricts you. Uh, now they're restricting the VPN. So I used to have a uh, virtual private network that got around this, but uh, they're putting more and more locks on those as well. So you can't use them. Hit the arrow in that story if that's pissing you off. Yeah. Hit the right arrow. We've done it. And this one here, a CD that self destructs after one play, uh, this is uh, sort of a joke, but in fact, I think it was uh, uh, Senator Hatch from uh, Nevada, uh, no, Utah. He brought this up in uh, the Congress. He, he introduced a bill to do this. Uh, it didn't get anywhere. Some people there at least had the intelligence to figure out this would not be a good idea. How many have heard of Error 53? Yeah, because we saw you stream live. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I only saw four of you. Yeah. <laughs> well, hopefully you will never experience it. And this is uh, when you get your uh, uh, your iPhone. And if, if you have it repaired by a non-official Apple dealer, um, the next time you upgrade your operating system, you'll get this error. And it disables it, and it's useless. It cannot be repaired. It, it becomes useless. It becomes just a piece of metal. And uh, some people uh, uh, have experienced that. The notable case was a reporter in Kosovo where they didn't have an Apple store. And he needed it for his work, so he got this uh, techie to fix it for him. And when he got back to England and upgraded his, uh, it worked fine after the guy fixed it. And he got back to England, and uh, when he upgraded his operating system, he got this error 53. So uh, it's, uh, again, showing that they are doing these things. They are restricting our use of our material. But none of that... All of that pales in comparison to what's happening. I was in Australia last month, and a guy bought his John Deere tractor, and he had a dispute with the company, and they disabled his tractor using software from afar. And uh, they're doing it with cars. They're controlling how you use your car. And the thing is, you can't get into it, into the operating system of your car because of digital rights management, but hackers can. And even worse than that is what about the heart pumps? They have software. You don't, when you buy the heart pump, you're buying just the device. You're not buying the software that's on it. You don't own that, so you can't control it. And again, hey, what about the voting machines? electronic voting machine. If you can't see the code on your electronic voting machine, how do you know what's going on? You have no idea what's going on. Yeah, so <laughs> so it's, it's a lot more it's a lot more serious than just e textbooks. It's 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 a major problem. Now on top of the digital locks you also have digital licenses. How many have read their licenses? Uh, when you click on I agree. Oh, one. Uh, two nerds in the room. 
Yeah, some of them are 60, 70 pages long. And they give them to these little tiny windows that you can't resize in yeah. two and a half point fonts. Yes. They don't want you to read those. Yes. There's a guy that copies iTunes every time they update the terms and conditions. Okay. The guy copies it, he has these records of how it's gotten longer and longer and longer. Yeah. And so he has them over like the last 10 years of iTunes, how they've changed it. Yes, and <clears throat> they just get more and more restrictive. But basically what they do is they reinforce all the things that you can't do because of digital rights management. And you agree that they have no liability even if the product doesn't work. Well, in common law, if you sell somebody something, it must work unless you put as is on it. There's an implicit guarantee that it works. It may only work for a month or six weeks or whatever, but there's an implicit guarantee. But you're agreeing that they don't have any liability, even if it doesn't work. You've agreed that they can invade your computer without your permission and collect and use your personal data. And this is not limited to your use of their application. They can go in and use any of your personal data. And you have a privilege to use the product that you don't own it. And this is a, a big one because it's a criminal offense in the United States that you're prohibited to show your content to others. So if you're a student and you show this to one of your fellow students, um, the, the license says you must immediately delete the application from your computer and contact them and advise them of your crime. You can't show it. Can you imagine being in jail for this? You'd be pretty low on the prison hierarchy, wouldn't you? It's, uh, it's a pretty minor offense, but nevertheless, it is a criminal offense. Um, how can we work with this type of uh, situation? And finally, you must accept that you have no rights. Well, we have fair, fair use rights, but we've agreed that we don't have them, that we've given them up. We've waived our fair dealing right. So there, with the digital locks and the digital licenses, it's become very restrictive. And with Google Chrome, we're going to own all of it, whether you like it or not. Deal with it. That's their attitude. Now, if we use open textbooks, we can do all of those things. That's why I believe that open educational resources are essential for e-learning implementation. We cannot work under those restrictions. It, become, it makes it impossible for us as educators to work with students with such restrictions. And here's a uh, part of a license. Uh, they can come in and inspect your computer, announced or unannounced, and whether it's located on the premises or elsewhere at any time. You've agreed they can come into your house. We pretty much, and I think people haven't paid attention, you've pretty much given ETA the right to access your phone, you check your email on it. You don't know it, you have done that. You probably haven't read that agreement. Yeah. So I was looking at the digital resource commons, and I was curious if there had been a Supreme Court case yet. And I can't find one. And the, the cases that I found against it are all in the circuit court. And I'm wondering if the Supreme Court is open to hearing the case, not that it will matter how I many years now. <laughs> the last case, like in 2010, was the circuit court. And if the person bought copy of something called auto disk that had never been opened. So and then it wouldn't work for the people or you know but it's because they, they did not have the right to sell the license. So even though the code was in there they weren't allowed to do that. The courts are you know upholding the digital rights management. Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, but uh, the um, they're developing a case now I understand in California over DRM uh, and bringing up these cases like the tractor and the heart machines and 
it seems to me a pretty strong case, uh, a lot stronger than just about any other kind of object. I don't know if you, I don't know how you will resolve the few cases come before this court arguing that some of those licenses are not good faith contracts because they're not presented in the way that they're And also, I don't see the contractors. There were a few cases, at least one case, I think, with I mean, the same one you talked about, where someone tried to repair a track they involved, but that was considered a breach of contract because they weren't allowed to open it up and look inside. They, that was decided in favor of the individual, saying you you have the right to repair stuff, but that should be considered that like the company doesn't then have to continue providing support. I could be mistaken. Yeah, I think that's how it's it's it, it, it's it's a legal quandary at the moment. It, it, it needs to be settled. Yeah, it's it's all be settled in a good way. I mean, there was one where the uh, um, uh, the student was selling textbooks from Thailand, and uh, he'd import them from Thailand, he'd buy them for $10 each, and they were charging in Massachusetts $250 for the textbook. So he'd sell them online, and he, he became a millionaire with this. So they sued him and said, well, the right of first sale only uh, is only applicable if it's bought in the United States. That was the publisher's argument. And it went to court, and he lost in the lower court, but it went, I think, to the California Supreme Court. And there they said, well, this is ridiculous because you can't sell your car because all kinds of parts of your car are made abroad. <laughs> like, like, it, it just didn't make any sense. And anyway, he won. And uh, I think he's uh, still selling textbooks from Thailand. They'll just have to come up with another model of, uh, uh, of selling textbooks in Thailand or the United States. So here's the question now. Do you own what you pay for? It's, uh, with these new uh, access rights of vendors, they control how, when, where, and with what specific brand of technological assistance audiences are able to access content. And you can see there in the map, they've divided the world at their convenience into areas. And if you buy your application in one in China, for example, and try to use it in Australia, it won't work. If you buy it in the United States or Canada and use it in Mexico, it's not going to work. So uh, they've, they've decided that on their own with no public input. And they brought this new concept into the world. You buy, but you don't get. Do you remember when the world we used to live in? You bought something, you owned it. Do you remember that world? We don't live in that anymore. It's a strange world. Um, it's like this. You buy a hammer, and they tell you you can only use it to hammer in these kind of nails. You know, you're not even allowed to hit anyone over the head with it. <laughs> you have to follow their rules about how you use your hammer. And uh, it's a totally new concept. And uh, we're in that world now. We did that one before. Uh, Corey Doctorow said, there's no theory of capitalism that says that my private property should be regulated by the state because there's a copyrighted work inside of it. And again, if we go back to that whole concept of a monopoly, uh, their monopoly regulates my property. And again, this is a new extension of, uh, 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 of, of what ownership means and what it doesn't mean. And uh, Audrey Waters put it this way, we all just share and rent on the powerful platforms of Silicon Valley billionaires. This is far from a satisfactory alternative. The post-ownership society. David Wiley put it this way, openness is the skeleton key that unlocks every attempt at vendor control and market. And that is why as educators, we go open, leave them. Let them make their copyright laws as strict as they want. We go down the open route. Um, they can't affect us or touch us. 
When you subscribe to content through a digital service, the publisher achieves complete and perfect control over you and your use of their content. Now, how can we participate? Well, we have an OER chairs network, international network, and uh, uh, there's uh, uh, the chairs in New Zealand, Brazil, Holland, Mexico, Slovenia, and the United Kingdom. And uh, um, we wanted a chair in, uh, a UNESCO chair in the United States, but the US is not very happy with UNESCO at the moment. They're not, uh, they're not playing ball. I'm not optimistic that your new president is going to be really overly supportive of UNESCO either. And um, not without good reason. Canada's a bit cheesed off with UNESCO too. They're, uh, it, it's a very overly bureaucratic organization and needs to be reformed in some way. But uh, these are our shareholders and partners. And we have a PhD in the study of OER with the Global OER Graduate Network. And that's a group of PhD students, their professors and postdocs who are all studying different aspects of OER. And there's European money available that brings the students and the professors together every year to exchange ideas and uh, talk, plus they have a network online. And uh, uh, highly recommendable for anyone who's studying uh, any aspect of OER. Um, we at Athabasca have created the OER Knowledge Cloud, and that is a repository of 1,300, more than 1,300 articles, scholarly articles and reports uh, about OER and MOOCs. And it's, uh, um, there may be some OER articles and MOOC articles that are not in here, but uh, if they aren't, let me know. We'll put them in, we, we have most of them. And this is an idea of some of the reports that are available uh, in the uh, cloud. And we're members of the OER Universitas network. Uh, over 30 institutions on five continents. In the US, we've got Excelsior College, Southern New Hampshire, and uh, Thomas Edison Universities, and uh, 30 around the world. And we're addressing this problem. Learners who access OER and acquire knowledge and skills cannot have their learning assessed and accredited. So we have this problem in Canada, and uh, I believe you have it in the United States too, is we have the most educated taxi drivers in the world. They immigrate to Canada with all kinds of education, credentials, and skills, and they cannot get them recognized in Canada. And so they're driving taxis. And we need to create for them pathways to get their credentials recognized. And uh, um, all around the world, there's people who know things, uh, who have learned things, and they cannot get their credentials. So the OER Universitas is creating OER pathways to learning. And we're starting this spring with the first year free online. So we have uh, uh, about 20 first year courses available to anyone in the world can take them and learn from them. And uh, uh, if they want to get a uh, credential, they go to one of the 30 institutions and uh, do their assessment and get the credential. And it works like this. The traditional model, you have our students taking our courses using our faculty and they take our assessment and they get our credential. The OERU model is any learners anywhere, they don't even have to be students, using any faculty or no faculty at all, using any course materials, OER or otherwise, but if they want an Athabasca University credential, they take our assessment and we give them our credential. If they want a University of Southern Queensland credential, they go and take their assessment. If they want the Excelsior credential, they go to Excelsior and take their credential. And that's the idea of the OERU model. I'm going to skip over these. This will be in here. More 
Hong Kong. Oops. If you want to just use the arrow on that keyboard, Roy, the right arrow will advance. Oh, there you go. So anyway, all these things are happening together, and uh, if you're not confused, you don't understand. Uh, the reason you're confused is because the world is confusing. And be very careful of people who know exactly what they're doing, because they are either charlatans or fools. Oh, this is much better. Now, everything you know is wrong. Every day, computers are making people easier to use. And innovation always produces hostility among those who prosper in the old paradigms. To finish off, uh, the Royal Society is the oldest scientific society in the world, in, in Britain. And they say that the restriction of the commons by patents, copyright, and databases is not in the interest of society and unduly hampers a scientific endeavor. And the previous Pope Benedict said that on the part of rich countries, there is excessive zeal for protecting knowledge through an unduly rigid assertion of the right to intellectual property. And what does this tell us? That both science and God is on our side. We are on the side of the angels. So I'll finish up with this story about the frog. And the idea is this is, you put a frog in water and you slowly heat up the water till it's boiling. And by the time he realizes that his legs are cooked, he can't jump and he dies. And I use this as an, an analogy to, uh, to point out that uh, uh, the technology is bubbling all around us. And at some point, we've got to jump. And if we don't jump, we're going to be cooked. Anyway, I put this story out on the internet. And I got an email back saying, very sorry, Dr. McGrail, but at 45 degrees Celsius, a knee-jerk reaction in the left anterior something, 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 of the frog, something, and extra muscle, causes it to automatically eject itself from the water. <laughs> and I thought, Oh my God, there's people all over the world putting frogs in water and boiling them. <laughs> so I put out a disclaimer. I said, uh, you know, there seems to be a cultural misunderstanding. I come from the maritime region of Canada, and there we don't let the facts interfere with a good story. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. It's fun. Well, thanks very much, Rory. <laughs> There's uh, certainly lots to think about, and I think the imperative of uh, looking at the ways in which content is being closed up is one that's a very serious responsibility for academics to think about. Um, we are entering, I think, a period of time in education within the current context, not just politically in the U.S., but really internationally, where uh, the corporate model of functioning is making a fairly significant impact on how universities operate. That's not necessarily a good or bad thing, it's a thing. But it does have an interesting impact. So, uh, for example, students who want to uh, buy texts that are buying text by code, and that code has a certain expiry cycle. Uh, that's short term. The longer term game is one that's quite a bit more sophisticated as companies like Pearson and McGraw-Hill are recognizing the value of OERs. They're now turning to two directions to control the use of resources. One is through the uh, provision of teaching materials to the educator, which means they make the teacher's job easier. And if a teacher's job is easier, they'll recommend a $250 textbook. So it's a form of coercion. And secondly, I think it's done through a more provocative way that ties in well with some of our interests in LINK, which is the data analytics centric model. But meaning that they'll provide uh, analytics, personalized adaptive learning, working with platforms like Newton in order to basically disconnect uh, what, what had been disconnected, the textbook from the teaching, and integrate the two together. So the teaching and the content become the same thing, and hence you have to pay for it. So my current view would be that if you use textbooks in your course, you're doing something wrong. And that's a very humble viewpoint. And I'll say that because I use a textbook in a course that's starting at AU 
next month on advanced research methods. All students will, uh, they won't pay directly, it'll be through the tuition, but they'll, uh, somewhere along the lines of $300 uh, per text that the students will use. The difficulty with OER is just binding them together and stitching them together more meaningfully. That's why some of the best initiatives are right now of BC Open Campus, uh, work with shared uh, textbooks or textbooks that uh, Cable Green initiative that he led when he was at uh, Washington State System. But these are collaboratives that come together and say every single psychology fac faculty uses some range of text within a state or within the country. Every single education faculty uses a similar suite of, uh, of academic resources. To actually collaborate and create those resources I think is a tremendous opportunity and can have a very direct impact either on the profitability of the university, if the university pays the text like Athabasca does, or on the tuition expenses for students, namely their ability to do away with texts and actually work with OER uh, resources and materials. More importantly, I think it actually advances their critical thinking capabilities because now they're hearing from multiple voices rather than a very sanitized unitary perspective in the form of textbooks. But we have a few minutes for Q&A for Professor McGreal, if anybody would like to, uh, I know uh, I did have a draft read of Mr. Shays and McGreal. Um, pretty boring. <laughs> Editing OERs through s and It's an awkward scene. No, but any questions for Rory? Why is constructionist pedagogy crap? Sorry? Why is constructionist pedagogy crap? That tells about connectedness. What do you think of this? <laughs> well, I can tell you a story about that. As George and I taught a course together, and George is on connectivism and constructivism. Am not I right? so much constructivism. Not, not so much. But anyway, he, uh, I sort of pointed out that he was giving these tests to students and that that wasn't really part of constructivist or connectivist ideas. And then I'm sort of a traditionalist and I was letting students go out, find their own articles and comment on them and do reports. And he said, well, that's not traditional. And what I find is that uh, um, all of these different philosophies um, that people aren't doing, that's why it's crap, they, that they say they're constructivist, they say they're connectivist, they say, like me, the traditionalist, we say we are, but really um, we're eclectic and pragmatic and we use all different ways. And so, yes, I, um, I don't believe it and there's too much in education too much of this either or business. I'm a constructivist. It has to be this way and this is the way you do it. And really I'm of the both and philosophy is you can use all different ones. I've used connectivism, constructivism, uh, behaviorism, I, all of them and uh, uh, try all different ways. And um, I have yet to see it. I'd like somebody to show me somebody who's a pure constructivist or a pure connectivist, and I'd like to sit down and, and see how they're doing it, and I would bet money that they're not. That, uh, uh, but, but they would swear on the Bible that they are, because they get an ideology stuck in there. The world is getting too ideological. It's not just in education, but in politics. We're all getting ideological. Instead of the founding principles in North America, and in the United States in particular, is pragmatism is if it works, use it. And uh, um, there's many different ways of uh, skinning a cat, and uh, uh, no one way is better than others. That's why I'd say it. Of course, I'd like to provoke George. He needs to be provoked from time to time. And actually, pragmatism is the big contribution that American thinking will have on the philosophical uh, legacy that dates back to Greece and beyond, so that's yeah. the unique contribution. America used to be very pragmatic, and now it seems they're all ideologues, either right-wing, left-wing, whatever. The, they get trapped in an ideology, and therefore I am a, a right-wing Republican, therefore I must think in all these right-wing Republican ways, or I'm a left-wing Democrat, and I must think in all these left-wing Democratic ways, and really, uh, 
pragmatism is the way. Sometimes one way is better, sometimes another, and it changes, uh, changes in a very fluid way. But people get stuck and they define themselves by their ideology. They define themselves. I am this type of a person. Sorry. Okay, so my uncle had this fun story. He told me that uh, he took a bunch of pictures. One of them, he was flying over the San Andreas Fault, took a picture of it, and then ended up putting it on his website like in, in the early 90s sometime. And um, he uh, later got, I guess, a uh, cease and desist letter or something like that, a threatening lawsuit because he had a picture, he had this one picture up that it was from a publisher. The parent the publisher had taken his content, put it in their textbook. And we were trying to sue him and you know making force him to take it down. He's like, well, this is my picture, and he had to prove it. Um, he was he actually still the negative, and he was able to prove that it was his. And I'm like, oh crap, you know, kind of thing. But have you seen anything like that with um, publishers going in and taking all this other content, and it seems like lawsuits going that way towards people that are creating all these things and putting things out there free and open for people to use? It's mainly people who make a business out of it, like um, uh, these. Uh, um, what do you call it? Uh, Patent trolls patent and people trolls. like that? No, uh, no, not so Gremlins. much. I mean, patent trolls is a problem, but uh, people who make a business selling their pictures and their content, and they go after people. But most of them, if they're, if they're small timers, uh, um, they can threaten to sue. They won't, but the big companies can sue you, and it'll just cost you a huge amount of money. Yeah. Well, so there was some interest. just read this yesterday. Um, a group of lawyers, or a couple of them out of uh, California, what they would do is they would buy uh, the rights to uh, pornographic films. Then they would have their staff upload them to Pirate Bay. Then they would track who downloads it and send them a letter uh, saying, give us $4,000 or we'll take you to court. Most people are thinking, oh crap, I go to court, it'll cost me way more than $4,000. Or, gee, I maybe don't want my family to know that I'm going to be sued for this. So they pay for it. They made millions, like $4 million over a couple year period with this scam of, of uploading. So there's an entire group of uh, feeder organizations out there that basically try and, Trolls, and yeah. yeah, like intellectual ventures. Uh, when I was in, in um, where was it recently in, in uh, Seattle, they created a Babbage machine, uh, the Babbage differential engine. And this was Babbage's design. It was his technology or his, his concept. He's very dead now. But uh, when I wanted to take a picture of it, they're basically a high-end patent troll. Like they're, they're the ones that try and settle for like $400 million with companies like, like Blackboard once they bought a portfolio of patents. And so this was Babbage's design, and they wouldn't let me take a picture of this thing that all they had done was created. it. So I mean, it's a fascinating concept how there's a group of people who – make money off of manipulating uh, patent and, and IP laws. Yeah. There's a company called Movie Licensing USA, and they went out and they, they made deals with all the major movie houses and got licensing to sell the licenses for viewing to public schools. So public schools are showing videos all the time that they probably shouldn't be shown, but you know, they're showing well, probably should. Yet, they're showing camera, and they're showing the Hollywood versions of it, they don't have the license to do that. So now they send it out to all the principals and superintendents. It's publicly available information to get. So they send out emails saying, hey, if you're showing videos, you need to pay this amount of money for this license. It'll cover your whole school. They legally made a whole bunch of money off the of school district. Still doing it today. Yeah. I'm a teacher education work college education. And I think what's missing in OER is like you need directional, like here's the product. Is for you to consume. We had some high school uh, people from Cornell well, High School were there share about how their high school students, they do tons of stuff with blended learning at Cornell High School. And they have, anyway, and so they have the students create OER curriculum. This was on health literacy or health or something. Put it on iTunes. And tons of people download it. I love that model of high school students creating content that's usable and accessible and open. I don't think we're doing that in teacher education. I don't think we're, we're teaching, seeing students as capable of creating content that can be put on the web, even though they're doing it anyway with video games or videos or whatever. I think that's what's missing. 
that no, that's a, no, there's a, a, a big group in the OER movement who exactly they want student created uh, content. It's not, it's not trickling over to teacher education, I don't think. Those yes, things. yeah, no, it, it is a big movement mainly in Europe because they're not as concerned about the textbook issue as we are. Um, they generally, the textbooks are free in universities. And so, but if you're interested in that, can you talk to me because I am working on the program for open education here through the libraries, and there is going to be some incentive for it and pedagogy, just student generated content that exists on the web as its own license and just. A lot of it, what I've seen, at least from K 12, is that it's not not put out there for mass consumption. It's just put out there for the local community. Right. The it's parents, I'd say, portfolio yeah. type. Yeah. You know, uh, this is what we did locally, but yeah. it's not really ever, you know, an get out of mass audience, which you can do with IQ University. But, yeah. Well, if, if, it, if, it wanted, if you wanted to get it out, you'd have to put a CC license on it and get permission from the parents. But if it's done locally, I don't think there's much so problem. Doing things like yours ahead of time. Yeah, but uh, there's, uh, I mean, there's 23 states now that are leading in uh, OER. It's it's a growing movement. It's an indicator to all there. It's big. I, I was just uh, at a meeting uh, with our ministry in uh, last week in Alberta, hoping that we'll be the first in Canada because we're not doing it at all. But in the state, there's 23 states that are getting big on OER. And, it Even seems, some of the charter systems have, uh, you know, some of yes. work with setting up charter schools that are exclusively OER based. Yeah, I think I'd like to run a charter system. You familiar with ck12.org? Sorry, ck12.org. No, it's it's a. I don't know if they're really OER, but they're free textbooks for schools mm -hmm. that you can. You know, we want this chapter from this one, this chapter. You can make your own textbook. Mm -hmm. They'll pass a lot of the issues and get exclusively for their digital textbooks. They're totally free. Yeah. But I don't know if they're really, because they're still under the CK12 branding, mm -hmm. I don't know if they're calling them open education. Are they free? Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. El Paso, they did something with the state. Well, Curriki is, uh, is the big repository for K-12 in the states. It's called Curriki, like Wiki. Yeah, initially, uh, what's his, uh, the dude at Sun was uh, heavily supporting that, and I think it's kind of faded away, at least with corporate support, but I don't know if they're self-sustaining yet. Yeah, it's not it, it's not uh, hanging in there, but uh, there's huge savings. I estimate for our province, it'll be about $85 million a year if they were to go to OER. I'm sure it would take them five to ten months to make the transition, but the savings are just so great that it's worth doing. We also know that the kids are doing things, they're, they're producing things that they're interested in for sure. I mean, I'm thinking like, I remember Marty Baker Stein talking a few years ago at the IOL conference in our keynote about one of the greatest number of videos and instructional videos was on YouTube was Rainbow Loom, you know, 12 year old girls putting on Rainbow Loom videos. Minecraft videos, these other things, like new, new kids that are going through tutorials together and showing how to do things, building community that way. It's, I mean, they're, they're, they're doing it, just not necessarily in ways that, you know. It's not pedagogically used or created. Yeah. Yes, like that's separate, right. They're out of school that day. What are they going to do with their, their yeah. education? It's just something they learn to do on their own because they're like, yeah. yeah. It's not working its way to the teacher ed. All right, well, I think on that note, we're at 1.30 now. Oh, no, it's 6.50. <laughs> so um, I think uh, we'll call it off here. Rory, thanks for your time. I know we're going to be around for a little bit, and then I'll get rid of him and get him back to his hotel. So Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you.